Okay, that should be it. Hello, everybody. I'm Nathan. This video, no, not today. Later today at 12:30. Uh, today we're here for the second day of NDC. Hope you had a first fantastic day. Uh, we're here to talk about controllers and minimal APIs, and this talk is as much about controllers as much as it is about minimal APIs and also what they mean for the future of .NET in general. So just a quick intro. Uh, I'm Nick. Hi. I'm a bunch of stuff. If you know me, you probably know me from YouTube. Actually, how many of you know me from YouTube? That's a good amount. Yeah, okay. Uh, for the rest of you, you have to go and subscribe. That's a requirement for this talk. Um, I'm also turning 30 in April, so I thought it's a great idea to start my own podcast, which seems to be also a legal requirement. So if you want to see some interesting podcasts with some amazing talks um, or discussions with people like Damien Edwards, Mads, for the future of .NET and C Sharp, I highly recommend you go ahead and check that out. Um, and also just a quick plug, if you like topics like minimal APIs, testing, or dependency injection, or other things that can really take your skills to the next level, then I have my own courses at nickchafsas.com. I highly recommend you check that out. Now, just a show of hands, has any of you seen this talk already from NDC London last year? What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> like, the, I mean, it hasn't really changed that much, but um, thank you for being here. Now, how many of you know what minimal APIs are? Can I just see? Okay, that's a good number. That's way better than last time. And how many of you have them in production? That's really good. And of the remaining uh, people who actually know who they are, who, who do you think, or just raise your hand, how many of you would never use them in production or think would never use them in production? Don't be afraid, this is a, this is a safe space. Huh, I saw you. Okay, so fun fact, minimal APIs are actually the most loved feature of the .NET 6 release, by far. I mean, when they came out, everybody just instantly loved them. It was amazing to see the community just come together on Twitter and really embrace and hug this awesome feature that really removes that barrier to entry of making a new API with tons of controllers and the startup.cs and program.cs and making it extremely easy. Obviously, this is a very long-winded joke. People hated it. Um, and some of them really still do. They think it is not for them, and they think that the ASP.NET Core team is actually wasting their time doing all this. Now, let's see if that is true by the end of this talk. But you might be wondering, for those of you who did not raise your hands, what are minimal APIs, Nick? Well, I could have a very fancy quote to just explain what it is, but really, there is nothing that describes what minimal APIs are better than this. This is fundamentally what minimal APIs are. These four lines of code are a valid API you can take right now and run in your .NET 6 and beyond code base, and it will work. There's a bit of a lie on this quote. There's actually a CS proj required for this to run because you need to specify that this is a .NET project, but as long as you have that there, you can do .NET run and will run. You're gonna have a single hello world endpoint. Now, for those of you who haven't touched C-sharp in a long time, you might be like, okay, how is that even possible? We're gonna see that. But before we see that, I wanna talk about the five fundamental points you have in here. So the first thing we have is this builder. The builder is responsible for configuration, logging, service registration for DI, and all that. Then between the builder and the next line is where you would have your log providers being added, your service registration, all that goes there. And then you materialize that configuration or that definition into a web application, which is this new abstraction of what is a web app in .NET that came in .NET 6. And then it's your time to shine. It is your time to add your endpoints. No more controllers, no nothing. You just say map, get, map, post, map, whatever. And then you can return a delegate. You can return an object. You can tell whatever you want. And that will be serialized and return to your browser. The last thing is just running the application, and that is it. But many of you who have worked with other technologies and other languages as well might be thinking, wait a damn minute, Nick. That thing over here, that looks a whole lot like that thing over there. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but those are not both c -sharp. The bottom thing is Express.js from the JavaScript world. So Microsoft was just blatantly ripped off Sorry, my, my lawyer, uh, they get inspired by Express.js heavily 
to go ahead and make the same thing. And there's a reason. Express.js has seen more use in web applications than anything MVC or ASP.NET Core has done in the past 10 years. Don't quote me on that, by the way. But clearly, there was a need for that, because why is JS so popular if it's such a bad language, but it is so widely used? Well, it is because the barrier to entry is just so, so low. So what if, or, or sorry, this is not actually uh, a new concept at all. Python, for example, with fast API, it's the same idea. All you do is you import fast API, you create your app, which you can imagine as the same web application factory, and then you define that endpoint, you define what you return, and that is serialized as a JSON object. Simple as that. Go, a more cool language and modern language um, does the exact same thing with a project called Jin. So Jin has this idea of a Jin.default, which is the same thing as a web application factory. Then you can do um, Jin.get, and you can define your delegate. You have your Jin context, which is the same as a HTTP context, and then you write a string, you write JSON, you write whatever you want back, and then you run it. Even NancyFX, we had this in C Sharp. How many of you remember NancyFX? Yeah, that, that was good old days. So NancyFX was this thing in ASP.NET where you could just have a module, and in that module you can define an array of get, post, put, whatever you want, and then your endpoints, and then have this delegate that returns hello world. And in this case, that would just return that, which at the time it was unheard of. Now, again, it wasn't new because Nancy in itself was actually copying Sinatra, which was a Ruby on Rails framework. that was very, very popular. And even here, you can see that exact same simplicity. Require Sinatra, get the, the route, do, and then end. And that is it. Now I want to go back to what we saw before with C Sharp. Because if you stop writing C Sharp in .NET uh, framework, or C Sharp 7.2, or whichever one is the last version, then you're probably like, how is that even possible? Well, I made a bit of an animation to show you how it's possible, and it took me three hours to make, so I appreciate it. So all of these features are flying and coming together. All of these were added in C Sharp 9, 10, and .NET 6, and that's how we get it. And just because I spent so much time for just, well, five, 10 seconds, we're gonna see it again just to appreciate it. It's good, isn't it? You can tell how proud I am about this because it has a watermark. Like, I don't want people to steal it. Like, that guy made it. Anyway, so let's talk about each one of those features individually. So we have top-level statements. Now, top-level statements are actually a C-sharp 9 feature, not even a C-sharp 10, which is the one that was paired with the .NET 6 release. And basically what happened is the .NET team took a step back and said, you know what? That looks stupid, because it's the same every single time. You always have, well, the namespace is optional, but you always have a program class. You always have a static void or static int main string array args. I know it sounds stupid. It's more stupid to write it every time. And we have three levels of nesting just to get started, which is just obnoxious. So what happened in C Sharp 9 is top level statements were introduced, where now you just have the using statement, and then you say console.write line and you have the text that you want. The rest of it is implied. It is still there. The code that you eventually compile is that same program.cs. But you don't have to have it there because it's supposed to be there by default. And it's what causes tons of confusion in my comment section when people who don't do C Sharp see me write something like this and like, what is this, scripting? It's like, no, it's C Sharp, it's, it's good. Like, okay, C Sharp has changed. I'm gonna give it a go, which is fundamental to this whole effort for simplicity. Now, some of you might say, hey, Nick, you could make it even simpler by just removing the using and saying system.console.writeline, just merging it into one line and be like, oh, we're cool. You can, have a, um, you can have a hello world with just one line of code. However, that would sort of kill this awesome segue to the next feature, implicit using statements, which is this idea that, hey, there's like eight using statements, eight namespaces that we're adding in every single one of our files or most of the files. And those are things like link, system.task, system itself, there's many of them. So now what you can do in C Sharp 10 is you can specify the implicit usings as enable, which is now is the default actually. And this will remove the need for the using system to be there and a bunch of others because behind the scenes.net will do that for you. 
And how will it do it? Well, with a new feature called Global Using Statements. So Global Using Statements is this thing where you can have a single CS, project fi CS file and drop a global using, global and something, and this will be globally added in every single one of your files. And really what happens when you do enable on implicit usings is a source generator kicks in and says, oh, you don't have one of these, I'm gonna go ahead and drop it. And if you say disable, it just deletes it if it's there. And now all of this is just implicitly added in every one of your files, removing the need for you to have this using system in the case of minimal APIs. Now another small feature that made this possible is called inferred lambda types. So previously in C sharp nine, even though the compiler has all the information it needs to know that this is a delegate function that accepts a string and returns a string, if you went ahead and you said var on the func, then it would not compile. It says, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what this is. So what C sharp 10 did is made that possible. And actually, this was very hard to do, apparently. I don't know why, but it was. And now, the last small thing was actually attributes on lambdas. So you could not have something like this before .NET 6 to say like obsolete on the lambda function, but because the .NET um, ASP.NET Core, sorry, team needed it, then now that is possible. And this is very indicative of the effort that went on during the .NET 6 release and the C Sharp 10 release, because the interesting thing about it is that the C Sharp team pushed the .NET team and the .NET team push the C-sharp team because the C-sharp team had to make those changes for .NET to do this and minimal APIs to exist. And this will actually continue with future releases and it's still happening. Now, at this point, I wanna go and take a look on a live demo and I'm not using Azure, so don't worry, this will work. And I'm gonna show you how minimal APIs really look like. So let me know if you can see this all the way to the back. Good? Good. So I'm gonna show you how to create a minimal API from scratch. And I'm not going to cheat by using a template, I'm just gonna make a console application. So I'm gonna go here in the getting started and say in .NET 7 in this case, and say minimal API dot demo. And it's a console and I'm gonna go ahead and create that. I'm gonna delete all of that and the only thing you need to do to actually turn this into a web project is actually go to the CS proj over here and specify in the project SDK that this is a Microsoft.net.sdk.many.web. That is it. The moment I save, you can see something is happening in the background. It is just installing a bunch of packages implicitly that you can't really see here in the dependencies. So now I can go ahead and say var builder, which is my first component. So web application dot create builder. And at this point, I can actually pass down the arguments of this project because they still technically exist because it is wrapped within that main method like we mentioned before. Then I'm gonna create the app, which is builder dot build. And then I'm going to run it. And this is it. Now, if you're coming from .NET 5, you're probably thinking, wait a second, there was supposed to be a startup.cs and I can configure services and now I can. So, no, you can. You can imagine that this is the configure services area. So anything between here, you can register. And anything between the app and the app run is actually your configure method from the startup.cs, the one where you configure the middleware. Anything between this doesn't really need to be ordered unless you materialize your dependencies because they will be materialized on app creation. Anything here, however, needs to be ordered. So if you use something like Swagger and you wanna have it outside of authentication, then you need to register it before your app dot add authentication call and so on. Everything is in sequence here. And one of the big problems this can cause, if you're not careful, is that you can create as many apps as you want out of that builder because that builder is just instructions on how to make web app. So this would start to applications, so be careful. Also, if you try to retroactively add the service, let's say a singleton, after you created your app, then this app won't be retroactively updated with the service. The moment you create it, it's there, you don't touch it. So 
let's go ahead and create our first endpoint. And I'm going to go with a very simple app.map.get for hello world. So hello. And I'm just going to say hello NDC. So let's go ahead and just run this. And I'm going to use this uh, .http um, file, which has some predefined HTTP requests. And I'm going to say run hello. So simple as that, I have something that returns effectively hello world, hello NDC. Now let's make it a bit more complicated because just returning raw text isn't really fancy. So what we can say is hello object. And I can just simply return an anonymous object here. And by default, it will be serialized. So hello equals NDC. Just run this real quick. And by default, the JSON serializer is used, you get a response back. Now we can take this a bit further because how often do you just work with anonymous objects? You don't really. So I'm gonna create a record, not that. Here we go, a user. And I'm gonna have a full name, so string, full name. And I can very easily, scroll down, say app.map get user. And by just returning the object, we have full serialization. Let's do this, Nick Chapses. Yeah, you know what? Chow us, fine. So let's rerun this. Unfortunately, hot reload doesn't work for this because you can't retroactively reload register endpoints. So I have to stop and start every time. But again, full serialization, you get it. But nobody does this. Nobody just has endpoints without parameters. Now the good thing is .NET or minimal APIs support some special parameters to be injected in the Lambda by default. So I can say map get special, and I'm gonna start with, I don't know, the most basic one, which is the HTTP context. So if you just say context here by default, oh, not, not my nemesis, parenthesis. Here we go. Then I can just say context.response.write as JSON async, and I can have the same user copied over, and then I have more control over what I'm writing. So if I also want to specify things like the status code, the response code, I can do that. Now, for this to work, I have to turn this into an async function. So this is async, and this is awaited. One of the biggest problems this causes is that you can technically return at any point, or you can technically not have anything here, and nothing will stop, compi stop compiling, but this will not you know, it will fail only when you call it. It's very, very dodgy the way this is implemented, which is why write as JSON async is not really used that much in normal applications. But in the same way, if you wanted to access things like the request query string parameters, you have everything here, you have full access. But maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want to narrow it down to some other special parameters like HTTP request or HTTP response. You can do that. You can have HTTP response here and only write that. You can also, let's go back here. You can also have a cancellation token. So if you want to cancel your request after some time, you do that and then you can pass that into your async methods. So you're not missing out on anything by going down this route. You still have all the goodies of controllers here or controller actions. Now, I want to show you how extra this can get, and I'm going to start with a get request. I'm going to say extravaganza here, and I'm going to show you how we can inject different parameters, because minimal APIs and this sort of model structure depend on a lot of impl um, implied uh, or assumptions, sorry. So if, for example, I say int age, where would this be coming from? I didn't specify where, but if I say return new age, then this has to come from somewhere. So if I just quickly run this to show you, 
it is going to be the query string parameter by default, 19. So you don't have to specify from query by default any parameter on a get request that is a primitive like this will be mapped from the route. You can also be explicit about it, so if you want, sorry, from the query string. If you want it to be from the route, then you can say age and you can even have constraints like int. So if you do that, then this will come from the route. You can also go down a different path. So if I say year here, and then int year here, then age is query string, year is route. This can get very confusing because you have all this cognitive load to keep in mind, you know, this is coming from this, this is coming from this. And it only gets worse. So let's say that age actually comes from, from query string. Nope, comes from query string, but it has a different name. You want it to be A in your query string. We can say from query and then name equals A. It turns out two equals, doesn't work, here we go. So if you do that, then you can map something like this where the query string parameter is just an A. You can still call it whatever you want internally. Do you want a header? From header. Do you want to inject a service from your DI container? You can say from service. However, this is another thing. If I just quickly grab this datetime provider and I put it here, this isn't something magical, by the way. It just is a way to test your daytime where you're uh, using it into your code. You just inject the interface and then you can mock it if you need to. Um, so if I just go here and I register this, here we go. Then I can just simply say I date time provider and I can use it. There we go. And even if I don't specify where this should be coming from, on startup, minimal APIs will actually detect that and say, who, oh, this is coming from query, this I can map to route, this I don't know, but it's not a body because this is a get, I don't have a converter for it, it exists in dependency injection in the container, that's what it is. And if you do that, then You can see everything here automatically mapped. You still have control to be explicit. And it goes even further. If this was actually a map post, then you can even have a user coming from the body and you don't have to specify anything. So you can say something like this. It can get too much. And that's why in .NET 7, there was actually a new feature added where you can say something like, um, presentation request, and you can wrap all of that into a record. So I can have everything here. I'm not gonna rename anything, just do not waste any time. But you can do this, and you can say as parameters here, and you can pass down your object. So presentation, request, request, and then you can use it. Here. So if you want to access the age and you want to have everything in a single contract, you can, which is a pretty neat thing to do. The problem is if I go down that route, I would be explicit about where things are coming from. Um, just to show you how this will fail, if I don't have the service in my DI container, but I actually try to resolve it, then let's see what happens. So nothing fails on startup. The application just started, which you know, depending on who you ask, isn't really great because I'd like something like this to be detected on startup, but if I do run it, response body is empty because in the run, you can see I got this error saying, hey, age is coming from an attribute. Route and body inferred? Request is as parameter, but the user is unknown. And there's a bit of a clash with a provider here. So it assumed that the provider came from the body and the user came from nowhere. So I'd be explicit, you're gonna, you're gonna write safer code by doing this, but fundamentally, this is what it is about. Now there's more features that were added in .NET 7, and we're gonna talk about them, but here we are.
So let's continue from here. So there are actually a few unsupported features, or at least upon release, there are quite a few. Um, first, there was no support for um, MVC filters. So if you have any IA sync action filters or result filters or exception filters, there was none of that when it launched, uh, and you still technically can't use those. There was no API versioning. Now, not the concept of API versioning. You can still, if you want, have v1, v2, v3 folders, and you can use route versioning or whatever you choose to do, maybe header. Um, but there was a NuGet package that Microsoft has in the .NET organization that at the time did not support minimal APIs. Uh, also, there was, and there still isn't, no built-in support for validation. So if you want to validate an incoming object, you actually have to write your own validator, which in my case, that is fine, because what I always did is I wrote my own fluent validation sort of class, and I passed that through a custom middleware, so I could still work my way around it. The problem is there wasn't any filters there, so I had to do it every single time for every endpoint, if I want to be fast. Uh, and there's also no support for old data. How many of you use old data? How many of you like it? Yeah, I thought so. Uh, so there's no support for that, but there, it might be coming, mainly because Microsoft themselves use old data, and that might be added in the future, but it's not here. Now, in .NET 7, we actually did get filters in a new implementation. It is not the same type of filters, but they're very nice, and they can be endpoint specific, very, very nice, clean implementation. And also, the API version in NuGet package now supports that. So if you want to go and plug that in, you can do that. And I do have a video on my YouTube channel on how to do that. Now, validation still does not exist built in. Uh, however, Microsoft is thinking of ways to add it. The problem is it needs to be very unopinionated and generic and also very, very fast. So they're thinking source generators. And from what I hear from David Fowler, he said, it is so hacky, you're going to love it. So I don't know what that means. Let's see. And the last thing is, you know, for the old data, you might get it eventually. It's not here, but to be honest, consider using uh, GraphQL with hot chocolate. I think it's a better experience, if you can. Now, I want to go to a very interesting phenomenon called program.cshell. So this was very much a common sentiment when the uh, minimal APIs launched, which is this idea of, oh, .NET 6 is out, I'm going to give it a go, I'm going to try to run um, a minimal API, build one, and then they end up with six app.mapget methods and six classes in one program.cs. They hate themselves, they think just, you know, web API is better, we're going backwards. And that is a very interesting observation to me because how often do you make a controller when you make a web API? And then in that controller, you add, let's say, the domain you're working with is a customer, you add your customer service, your customer contracts, your customer repositories, your customer mediator handlers, validation. You don't add all of that in a single controllers class. You split it. Nothing changes here. Minimal APIs are not one file APIs. All they are is a stripped down version of everything you could do before and broken down to its bare minimum. So let's talk about what minimal APIs are not explicitly. So like we said, not one file APIs. Just forget about it. When someone says that, just correct them. Minimal is about minimizing, first, the cognitive load in getting started and the uh, entry level, uh, enabling entry level developers uh, to build basically any API they want. Also, that they're not just for demos. As you just saw, however, they're fantastic for demos because I can very easily just have everything in a single page, scroll up and down, and you don't have to worry about, oh, this is in this file, and this is in this file, and this is in this file. And you know, everything is there, everything is easy to do. The problem with this is that Microsoft also heavily uses them for demos, and Microsoft's demos are like 2,000 lines of code, and people see that and think that's how you build an API. It is not how you build an API. So don't do that. And in the same way that they're not just for demos, they're not just for beginners. They are great for beginners, but in the hands of someone who really can structure a project, they can get really creative. So I think maybe the middle level is who it is really not for, or maybe not for, but beginners and experts, prime candidates for this. 
And then the last thing is, because I hear this quite a bit actually, they're not going to kill controllers. The reason why this came about quite a few times is because Microsoft has been very vocal about saying they expect 40 to 80% of all new use cases to use minimal APIs, which is a bit optimistic in my opinion, like it's not really going to happen. Um, but certainly for some use cases, this can be very, very good and very, very vi viable as well. But at this point, I actually want to take a second to just address the elephant in the room because I do believe that controllers for building APIs are a really weird concept and I, I did not get it. So I went back to see why we're using controllers for, for, for building APIs, you know. How do you think they came about? Do you think that the 10 smartest people in Microsoft sat down and said, okay, let's put it down. Performance, engineering, architecture, structure. What's the best way to build an API? And they said, oh yeah, controllers is the way to do it. No, what happened is they needed to write the whole REST API, web API to WAVE, and they had this thing called MVC. So what if we take the controller aspect, which has validation, model binding, and JSON, XML, and HTML response, and just keep the C. Because really, what is the last time you used a view in your APIs? You haven't. So what are you using controllers, which is an MVC construct, in your APIs? Well, it's just rebranded MVC. Also, models in MVC, they're not really API contracts in the way you, we use them, because in API contracts, and APIs in general, you have an input and an output object, and they're separate, they're not the same thing. So it's not quite models, so we're using just the C from MVC, and the truth is it was just the easiest way to get it out of the door and have it in the hands of consumers in a reliable way, because MVC did work, and it still works, people still use it with success. There's nothing wrong with MVC. However, I have an issue with that structure because they have all these methods, these actions within that controller that they never call each other and the only thing that really calls them is the router. So you have a bunch of public methods in a public class that nothing explicitly calls. It doesn't really make sense why they should be together. And this becomes more obvious if you think that really they're actually violating the open close principle. Because what do you do to add a new endpoint into your API. You open that controller's class and you edit it. What do you do to remove one? You open that one, the controller's class, and you delete the method. So why are we doing that? But where's the separation of concerns? Where's the same responsibility? Oh, my responsibility is a, is a controller. Well, why don't you go more narrow and have full control into that responsibility? Because it is not uncommon to have services injected on the controller level that are only used on a single action. But because those services could be transient or scoped in dependency injection, those objects are being instantiated every single time. And you're wasting memory for things that will never be used by that service or by that action. So why are they sharing real estate? I really do not understand this. Another thing is that they never share state between actions because controllers are actually scoped per request. So you don't have something that will be reused by all the methods. So why are they all together? It just sounds very dumb in isolation. It sounds smart in the context of MVC because you have a direct correlation between your view calling the controller. But between the API calling the controller, there is no correlation. And also, when you have private methods, because you thought, I'm going to just extract this private method, and I'm going to, because it's getting too big, and I'm going to give it a nice name and use it, they're usually used just by a single action. So you have a private method in a class that's only used by a single action. Okay, then should it be a local function? Oh, that looks too big in a single method, and then maybe you don't even need that. Well, why don't you just split that? Then they do invoke middleware and filters that you might not need implicitly. All that validation, all that model binding, there's tons of things behind the scenes that are happening that your actions don't need, but you're paying the price of those objects being instantiated and that memory needing to be garbage collected every single time. They have tried to make it efficient, but there's so much you can rip out of a system like MVC that has been running for years. Now, they can also grow to that thing called fat controllers. I don't know how many of you 
have heard of this term, but they can grow to quite a lot, uh, a big size, and very commonly, the, the, way so that, the way people solve this problem is they actually introduce mediator, and then they move all the logic into a handler, so they brag that, okay, my controller actions is actually just request mapping, mediator send, and response mapping. Well, that sounds something like you can put somewhere else and not have the controller in the first place. Like, why do you need this if it's so simple? Um, and the truth is that the reason why we have just accepted it and used it is because they are the only viable option for building APIs in .NET, or they were the only viable option, if you really want to be a nice REST API. Yes, NancyFX was a thing, but at the time, people were not really uh, happy to base their whole livelihood and the whole company on an open source project that might die. And in fact, it did eventually die. Now it is sort of reincarnated with a different project called Carter, um, but I still wouldn't use that because it's competing with minimal APIs and it's just playing catch up. So let's talk about what this talk is, uh, let's talk about what this talk is about really. And like with everything in life, this talk is about Lego. It is always about Lego, and I promise you, this metaphor will make sense. So what do you see here? Just think in your mind. Yes, it is a Lego castle, but just try to think outside of the box. So what you have here is a half-started or half-finished castle, and I can see a door, I can see foundation, I can see windows. There is a structure there, there's another one over there. And the great thing about a half-started or finished structure is that if I go to my nephew, who is five, and obviously five-year-old, not the smartest, and I say build a castle, well, he's watched Harry Potter, so he's gonna build something like this, without any experience, just because there is enough structure in something like this to eventually lead to that. Now, it might not look that great because, like I said, he's five, but it is good enough. But the good thing about this is that if you give it to me, who has never really built any fancy castles, but I do have the imagination to use Lego, then I'm also sort of set in a path of success because there's enough here for me to get inspired and finish what someone else has started. Now here's what's very interesting to me. Let's say that you take all of that away and you give to the same five-year-old ground and a bucket of infinite amount of Lego bricks with any color and any size. And I say, hey, build a castle. What he's probably gonna build will look something like this. Now, is this a castle? Uh, it depends on who you ask. To me, it looks really bad. To him, it does look like a castle. That's what he wanted to build. It serves a purpose. He got a crack at it. He used his imagination and he built it. But then if I go to his mom, who's actually uh, an architecture major, medieval architecture and Gothic architecture, and I say, hey, can you build a castle with those same ingredients? Then what she's gonna end up with is potentially a masterpiece. Do you get it? This is what controllers look like to me. There is enough structure. You start from this controller class, from this, from this action that there is no room for experimentation. No room for, exper no room for experimentation means very low likelihood of failure. You're gonna end up with something that, on something that is quite good, not perfect, but good. And that's why we have things like clean architecture be so big, because experimentation actually starts past the controller. We sort of agree that controller is a problem we need to solve, and then we add 15 layers of abstractions because we're obsessed with it just to complicate life and say, oh, if in the future I need to change my database layer. How many of you have changed your database service in your project ever? Just show me. How many of you during that process didn't have to change the interface that you abstracted your thing around? Yeah, exactly, one person. Like, if you go from something like an RDBMS to a NoSQL database, your access patterns will change. You won't be able to do the same things as you did before. So this promise of, in case I change it, is a bad hill to die on, in my opinion. But the good thing is, junior developers, mid-developers, and senior developers will end up with something that is 
pretty good. But in the same way that a junior developer will build a very bad API, at least the barrier of entry was pretty low. You don't have to even worry about something like this. Okay, where do I put the brick? I have to find the right brick to put the thing and then it's like, even that makes things complicated. But such an approach to a junior developer with no experience makes it very easy to get your foot through the door and say, you know what? This thing returns what I need. This thing can work. And here's the good thing about this. Yes, they build something bad, but next time they do it, they're gonna to try to do it better and better and better and better. And as the time goes on, they're gonna improve. And also, the way to get started was very easy. There was nothing you need to know about. Go crazy. But take a staff engineer or a principal engineer or a senior engineer to whatever we call them these days. Uh, and we say, okay, create a, a, a properly, very nicely architected API with all the tools you can ever need. Then they will certainly build something like this. Because now they have the freedom to do that and the freedom to control their foundation. You cannot build something like this on this foundation. It's just impossible. You're going to build basically a castle on top of a toothpick. Which is, in my opinion, what clean architecture is. So what are minimal APIs, really? Well, again, in my opinion, I think they're an unopinioned way to build high-performance APIs in .NET with minimal amount of implicitly added features and the flexibility to opt in the features and the structure that, that you need. It's about you. It is about choice. So now, with all that said, let's take a look at what is possible with minimal APIs. I'm going to go back to this project over here. I'm going to show you this structured API. Now, this is on GitHub, so if you want to just use it and do something with it, just search Nick Chaps' GitHub, you're going to find it under a minimal API. <clears throat> so what do I have here? This is an API built on minimal API technology. You wouldn't know just by looking at it, because it has folders, it has settings, it has validation, it has structure. Well, this is only possible because we now have minimal API technology backing it up. There are no controllers in here. I'm going to start this and show you how it works. So, your regular API is here. And then I'm going to go to the structure.http and call some endpoints. So, what I can do, this is a REST API with customers being the object you're dealing with. And I'm going to go and try to get all the customers in the system. Now, there's no customers. So I'm gonna get an empty response. What I can do is I can create a customer. So I'm gonna go here and just say, create that customer, and the customer was created. I used update to do that. Or did I? No, I used create, that's good. So you have um, 201 created the right status code. You have the location header over here. This is exactly how REST API would be. I can go ahead and edit that user using the uh, ID and delete that user. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you can also retrieve that user. So this works and behaves as a REST API. Um, it also, if I go in the console, has full Swagger support. So all my documentation about this API is here, customers endpoint, the object is here, the, the accepts is here, everything is here very, very nicely. They requested not pass validation checks, customer was created successfully. This is all the documentation you need in your minimal API. But how is that even possible? Well, let's take a look how it is. My entry point for this structure is actually this endpoints folder. So I have all of my endpoints for my customer in here. So if I want to create a customer, all I do is I say HTTP post customer, and then in this case, I say allow anonymous, I have no authentication. And then I create a class that extends the class endpoint. And then I specify my input and my output, my request contract and my response contract. And that is it. I don't have to explicitly make it be referenced anywhere because in program.cs it will be automatically uh, grabbed. So all I need to do is actually create a class, extend endpoint, and that is it. I have an endpoint. And now in here I have everything that is just explicitly required by this endpoint and nothing else. 
Customer service, that is it. Do I need a logger? It's only injected here. Do I need something specific to create, like publish a message for customer creation? Only here, I don't need to inject that anywhere else, like the get, which is what you would do in controllers. And then I have this handle async method where I'm getting the request, I do have a cancellation token, I'm converting it to a customer, and then create, map, return. And that is it, that's all create does. I can go to other things like get all, same story, in this case, endpoint without request because get all doesn't have an object that you need to get, it's just a customer's call, same thing, you return it. And please, by, uh, do not think that this is the way you should be building an API. This is just one of the ways you can build them just because now it is truly possible. Yes, technically you can say, Nick, you could do that by having single action controllers. You didn't need this. But this is actually way faster because minimal APIs are faster. And now you control the full pipeline, which you do not do in old school MVC. Another thing is that now if I want to have a validator, the only thing I need to do is just create the validator class using Fluent Validation and then specify the request object and that is it. No what do I need to say this validates this. It is implied based on what the abstract validator is created for. So if it's not empty, it's gonna fail. Or if it is empty, it's gonna fail. Same with everything else. The other thing is the summaries. If I wanna document an endpoint, the only thing I need to say is create a summary class that extends summary and wraps that endpoint. So summary for that endpoint. And all of my documentation for that endpoint is here. You could, of course, use XML comments as well on that endpoint class, that's totally fine, but you can also have it in a single class, which, which I personally prefer. And then you have other stuff, like your mapping, if you want to have any of that, and the startup.cs, which is where all the magic is happening. So that's what my startup.cs is, and my project.cs looks like, sorry, program. And the only thing I have here is this add fast endpoints call. Now, fast endpoints is a third party library that is using minimal APIs to make that possible. I was actually working on something that is effectively what fast endpoints end, end up being. Uh, and because the developer was way faster than me, I actually just reused that. So, fast endpoints is what provides all this logic. And then we have a middleware to catch everything. Like I said, sequence does matter. And then I'm not cheating here, the only thing I'm hiding from you is this error response um, building. So if we catch a failure, we wrap it into a specific object and then we just return it. But really, that is it. So maybe it is not for you, but it is definitely for me and what I needed. And this is, again, what is, this is about. It's about you, it's about choice. Now let's talk about a phenomenon I like to call minimal value, just to sort of describe what's the minimal API viability per project. And if, even though the horizontal line is supposed to show time, um, it's really type of project because the life cycle of a project usually these days looks like this. So I think that minimal API is extremely viable for beginner projects, demos like we already saw, proof of concepts, and, well actually proof of concepts. <laughs> so for those things, you can just very quickly get started, you can very quickly have a demo, very quickly have a proof of concept, and the amazing thing about the last one is that you can take your POC exactly as it is and turn it into a real application without too much effort. Because you have a blazing fast structure with minimal APIs, and you can just reuse that. You don't need to migrate or graduate into controllers, which is the assumption of many people. But I don't think that it's really viable for these chunky enterprise applications. Now, chunky enterprise applications doesn't really mean, you know, monoliths beyond saving. It can still be a very well-architected uh, modular uh, monolith. But I don't think that the type of project, company, and developer really will benefit from moving away. Because if your API or your app is slow, you're not going to get anything from the benefits of using minimal APIs. However, I do think that the best case scenario for minimal APIs and the best use case is actually microservices. Minimal API, microservices. Both of them are supposed to be small. I've never written one that's more than 1.5 thousand lines of code. The complexity is on the architecture. So why don't we keep the code very, very simple and easy to work with? So that's how I feel about this. Now, 
I want to wrap this talk by talking about the importance of minimal APIs, about .NET in general, and about you. Let's talk about how people get into a programming language. So there's many ways, and this is not an exhaustive list, but they probably have an idea they want to build. That's how many of you maybe got started. Um, my cousin wanted to get started with programming because he wanted to build Tetris from scratch. How do you do that? Well, I have an idea, I'm gonna just do it. University, school, college, I'm sure many of you have also studied programming because of that. Curiosity as a beginner, how do you do that? Or that person on YouTube said, said they can make, I don't know, $150,000 a year by just taking a boot camp. I wanna do that as well. That's a lie, by the way, it's never gonna happen. Uh, you know, they're selling the dream. Also, curiosity as an experienced programmer. This is another one. I personally really like to get into other programming languages to see where C Sharp is actually getting inspired from because there's just all of these features being added. They're not features you've never seen anywhere else. They're all coming from somewhere, uh, usually F Sharp. And the last thing is because the company is using it. That's how I got started with C Sharp. I desperately needed the job. The first person who said yes, um, just happened to use C Sharp in the company and I just got into it. But here's the thing, these are the only ones that really are relevant for C Sharp. Now you can say, Nick, the Unity game engine actually gets a ton of people into C Sharp. But the truth is, for any of you who have seen Unity code, it's a whole different story. It's, it's the wild west over there, there's no rules in the way you can write C Sharp in Unity. So it's not the type of developer that would really graduate into an ASP.NET Core developer, and maybe it's not the developer you really want to hire. So let's focus on these three. Now here's the thing about this. Only this one is one that we can sort of control with C Sharp, because universities change what they teach, schools or colleges, and companies migrate from Java to Node to maybe C Sharp to Rust eventually to whatever they want. So let's take that, keep that in mind and take that and talk about trains. And you know how the Lego thing actually worked? This one won't, this is just completely random. It's just not gonna happen. So how do trains work? So you get on a train, you stay on the train, you get off the train and the train will keep doing this journey as long as there's passengers. And this very much applies to many things in life as well as in programming languages. So let's talk about the Programming Language Express. People pick up a language, People use a language, people stop using a language, and the language is dying when A plus B minus C is decreasing over time. So effectively, the more people, the, the less people you have using a language, uh, over time, that's when your language is dying. But there's also a catch-22 with this situation because the more people use a language, the more people are likely to use a language. And the more people stop using a language, the more people will stop using a language because it's not popular anymore. So if you get into that downhill trend, it's very hard to recover. C Sharp is good at B and C, at people using the language, they love it, I absolutely love it, and I've written many languages since I got started with C Sharp and always something is missing. And also people stop using C Sharp because it's been around for 20 years, maybe you picked it up at your 40s, you're retired now, you don't need to use it anymore. So with constant amount of people you know, retiring us or stop using it, we also need an equal amount of people picking it up if we want the people, um, the language to, to survive. So ultimately, minimal APIs are a step towards increasing A. It is a step towards getting it to the hands of new developers that are the developers that will eventually be the future of .NET. So when you hear people say things, or you say things like, the .NET team should not be working on things like this, this is not something that they should be wasting the time with. This is not for me. Well, the truth is that if you want to be in a situation where you can hire the next generation of C Sharp and .NET developers, then it is for you, even if it's not for you. Thank you very much and keep coding. <laughs>